Hello, everyone. Welcome to our 2021 image analysis training. Um, I'm Sarah Woodbury. I'm the communications and outreach director for Wild Utah Project. So if you have questions throughout this uh, presentation, feel free to just send them to me in the chat. Um, we are so grateful to have all of you here. I'm seeing some familiar names from our wildlife camera portion of this project, as well as some new names and just welcome to all of you. And I just wanna take a moment to give you all a huge thank you for your care for wildlife in the West. Um, you really are what makes this project possible. And our presenters will go further into this project and all of its amazing impacts, but I'll just say that it's one that's incredibly important to wildlife conservation. So thank you so much for being here. And as we begin this training, I also just wanna take a moment to acknowledge that many of us are on indigenous ancestral and traditional lands. And if you're based in or near Salt Lake City, like we are at Wild Utah Project, then we are on the ancestral lands of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute people. So as we're involved with these images from across the Wasatch, we just wanna invite each of us to immerse ourselves in the histories and current realities of local indigenous groups. Um, to start, it's very simple to check what land you're on. I personally use an app called Native Land, but there are lots of great resources online as well. And we also just want to briefly note that Wild Utah Project and all of our partners on this project value the diverse perspectives and experiences of all of you, um, as well as staff, partners, and the rest of our volunteers. So we just want to point out our DEI policy, which is outlined on our website which essentially just asks and expects that each of our volunteers, staff and partners treat each other with respect. So if you have questions or notice something, please feel free to reach out to me or anyone on the Wild Utah Project team. And I'll pop that link in the chat in just a minute. Um, and then let's see here, I've got to admit a couple other people. Um, briefly, just a couple housekeeping items. So to ensure a good connection for this presentation, we ask that all of you stay muted and don't share video during the presentation. You'll be able to turn it back on and unmute yourselves during our Q&A session at the end of our presentation, um, just so you can ask questions that way. But until then, if you could keep the mute button on and the video off, that would be great. Um, and then as well as you have questions or thoughts that come up, feel free to share those in the chat, which is at the bottom of your screen, and we will address those during the Q&A session. And then also we may share some links in the chat box, um, so, but know that they'll be included in a follow-up email as well, so don't worry about trying to save them, but those will also be in the chat box below. So then just briefly going over the agenda, we are first going to hear about uh, the, some of the background and context for this project. And then we'll go into the training section um, so you can learn everything about how to get involved in this project. And then we will have a Q&A session around about 740. So it is my honor to introduce Dr. Mary Pendergast who will be talking to you first. So Mary has a PhD from Utah State University in biology and community ecology, and she has been with Wild Utah Project for about seven years now as our ecologist and conservation biologist. And when she's finished, you'll hear from Austin Green, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Utah, where he studies how human influence affects mammal distribution and behavior um, in an effort to apply this knowledge to on the ground conservation. So thank you, Mary. Thanks for the intro, Sarah. Austin, if you want to progress to the training agenda. Thanks. Yeah, so just a, a quick review. I'm just going to keep the background and introduction to the project uh, really short, hopefully stick to 10 minutes. But we thought that this would be important because we know that a lot of you are joining us for the first time. So although we have a lot of return participants, we want to give at least a little bit of background on the project um, for folks who are new, um, and then we'll get into the details of the actual training to support the image analysis um, starting at 7.15, and then loads of time for question and answer session, hopefully at the end. And just a reminder, this whole thing is being recorded, so you don't have to take notes rapid fire or anything like that. You can always go back to the recording. So if we want to progress, thank you, Austin. So just a reminder, 
The West Edge Wildlife Watch is a partnership primarily through Utah uh, Wild Utah Project, as well as the University of Utah, and in particular, Austin Green, um, the soon to, P soon to be PhD graduate. Um, and you'll hear from him shortly. And the next slide, just a little bit about what we do and how we work at Wild Utah Project. Um, you know, our tagline is science in service of wildlife and land conservation. So we are really focused on um, developing conservation tools and strategies that our state and federal agencies and wildlife managers and conservation planners can use. And often to get to those strategies, we ask pretty basic ecological questions that require filling some uh, fundamental data gaps like where is the species distributed and what's the current condition of its habitat and where do those habitats occur. And in order to collect those data in a robust and meaningful way, we need to identify existing protocols um, and make sure that we're using most up-to-date scientific research practices for that particular field. So often we partner with academicians to fill those data gaps in a useful, consistent, and robust manner. Sometimes those protocols lend themselves to a community science project. If we can get folks some formal training so that we can maintain that quality and consistency of data, um, it allows these projects to be applied to conservation much more quickly. And community scientists like you all allow us to collect data for larger geographic areas across larger timescales, and also to, in this case, analyze those data, looking at wildlife images faster than we could on our own, um, just with one nonprofit and one academic partner. So what you guys are all thinking about supporting and interested in doing today is super important um, for that process of getting data and research converted to something that can be applied for conservation much more quickly. Um, and the next slide, we could not do this work without our other community partners. So in addition to community scientists like you all, we have other partners that provide support, including funding and other resources and participation, other nonprofits, municipalities, as I said, state and federal agencies that are on the ground doing this conservation planning work. Um, and of course, our academic research partners. And the next slide, just a little bit about, <coughs> excuse me, about our study area. So in green, you see that polygon there, that's the mountainous area of the central Wasatch Range. And it makes up a little over 32,000 hectares. Compare that to on the next slide, all five of our national parks combined about 345,000 hectares. And the reason I draw this contrast in area, um, the last few years, the visitation annually for recreation um, has been roughly the same for that 32,000 hectare area compared to that 345,000 hectare area of all five national parks combined. So it's kind of mind boggling when you think about that previous slide with the green polygons um, for the central Wasatch Mountains, we're looking at, you know, um, City Creek and uh, as far north as City Creek and Red Butte and down south uh, as far as the Cottonwood Canyons, um, you know, those seven parallel canyons getting a ton of recreation activity lots more vegetation, visitation from people all over. Um, so if you go to the next slide, what this does is evoke a lot of questions, a lot of planning that needs to be done in terms of vehicle transportation planning and recreation activities um, to ensure that we you know, maintain that ability of multiple use for people in this beautiful space while also maintaining or improving native wildlife habitats and making sure their populations remain viable on the landscape. If you can go to the next slide. So this is especially important in light of transportation planning decisions that are happening right now in the central Wasatch Mountains. 
So we really need to identify and fill baseline uh, information, baseline data for wildlife movement, where corridors and pinch points might be for movement, where crucial habitat use is happening for wildlife before we start altering this landscape by increasing um, corridors for vehicles and human transportation. And if you go to the next slide, here you can see within the study area, this is from 2020, but these are the distributions of the uh, cameras for the field season. And this mimics what happened in 2021. Um, and so some of you who decide to participate in identifying wildlife and sorting images that have wildlife in them from this project, these are the locations, or this is the study area um, that you'll be looking at those images from. And I can give you more details on that if we have time in the q and I'm sure there's lots of questions about the field portion of the project. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, the way these, these data are used, uh, one way that is particularly useful for conservation planning is the creation of things like this wildlife hotspot map <clears throat> or this map that shows areas of concentrated habitat use. So this can be really crucial to making infrastructure decisions like where um, should a wildlife overpass or underpass go? Where should um, speed limits be looked at it again to reduce vehicle wildlife collisions and all sorts of decisions like that. So you can imagine how useful a map like this would be. Um, so analyzing data from those cameras about habitat use gets us maps like that. And we can look at it across species or you'll see on the next slide, we can look at it based on the uh, guilds or functional groups, so carnivores versus herbivores. And we can also look at it, as you see on the next slide, by individual species. And just to wrap up um, quickly on the background of the project, I just wanted to share a couple of recent um, publications. So um, a recent paper that Austin and I have worked on, but um, also many other authors who have done similar camera studies um, have put together this paper entitled, Wealth and Urbanization, shape medium and large terrestrial mammal communities. And the upshot of this paper that was published in Global Change Biology is that economic factors play an important role in shaping the urban mammal communities. And ecologists and social scientists really need to be working together to understand and improve the relationships between wildlife biodiversity and urban planning or how we plan our landscapes. Um, and so the, the data that you all are helping sort through analyzing wildlife images eventually go into larger data sets like these that really contribute um, to our fundamental understanding of uh, conservation biology and planning. And the next slide, another paper that um, is recently coming out of Global Change Biology we can progress to the next one is uh, disturbance type and species life history predict mammal responses to humans. And what I wanna highlight, there's a lot of interesting information in this paper, but um, this one provides insights on how human activities shape mammal communities globally. So we're looking at lots of data sets together in this paper, uh, revealing concepts like what are the drivers of the loss of large predators in some human modified landscapes, but not others. Um, so you can imagine how, again, how important it is to understand these mechanisms of how we change the landscape and how that affects different species based on their behavior and life history traits. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, I think we are transitioning into how you can help and how you can sort uh, wildlife images and help us get these data into a data set um, more rapidly so that again, they can be applied to conservation planning. And so with that, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Austin. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Mary. Uh, just to kind of piggyback on what Mary was talking about, um, these data that you're going to be looking at and contributing uh, to this project, if you choose to help us upload these photos, they are going to real world applications every single day. Um, and the more data we have, the more of these scientific investigations we can look at. So we're gaining a better knowledge of how urban wildlife communities are structured or how human influence is altering a bunch of different mammalian species, both here and across the United States and the globe. But then not only that, we can now start with the large enough data set that we have using these data and the products that come from these scientific publications to start affecting how we manage wildlife here at home. And that is kind of my major goal is using this information to not only advance the science of urban ecology and behavioral ecology, but also to go a step further and then start applying that information to conservation and management strategies. And so that's what we're actively working on right now is providing all these data and getting this information and doing these analytics so that our partners that are doing the ground on, like on the ground work, they have that information in place and they can start building strategies based off that. Um, and so that is kind of the segue into how you're going to now do that. We're going to be using this program, Wildlife Insights, to upload all of our photos. <clears throat> I'm super excited about this program. Um, if you've been with us before, you're probably used to eMammal, and eMammal had some great things about it. Um, but as many of you know, it also had its quirks. Uh, and so the hope with Wildlife Insights, it's the same developers, much of the same organizations, but now we have new partners, new uh, directives, and I feel like it's a much better, much cleaner website that is both more user friendly and is going to give us some more powerful analytics on the back end. So I'm really excited about this um, program, and I just want to dig now right into how to get involved. So the first thing you'll need to do if you're interested in getting involved is go to Wildlife Insight Insights and create an account. Um, and so I'm going to show you how to do that right now. And so what you'll do is you'll go to the home page for Wildlife Insights. When you do that, there's a little sign in portion right here at the very top. You're going to click on that. And then you're going to go into the sign up to Wildlife Insights portion. <clears throat> it then has a short qu uh, questionnaire for you. You will have to provide all this information. It's just your name, email, and password. Then go ahead and agree to the terms after you've read them and stuff and then you sign up. Once you sign up and you are ready to go, you will receive this email, which is saying your email has, need, uh, you, you've got your cre uh, account created, you now need to verify that account. All you have to then do is click on this money, uh, button to verify your account. It'll take you to another page that says, all right, your account's been verified and you will receive another email, which says, all right, your email address has been verified. Now, typically, that is all you'd have to do to sign up to a pro uh, program. But with eMammal, we did have some issues with security. And so they've now added a new um, portion that you'll have to do, and that's to get approval from both the project administrators and the project managers, which is myself. And so in order to do that, you'll then have to apply for account approval, and the link will be in that account verification email. So when you click that link, it's going to take you to this page right here where it's going to ask you, I have to bring it down, sorry, because I'm seeing all the faces down here, but it'll ask you a few questions and all you have to do is provide the information that is asterisks right here. All the other information is basically just kind of going a little more in depth than you'll need to do. So you just need to fill out the parts that are asterisk, go down to here and click submit. That then sends the notification that you are a legit volunteer that wants to participate in a particular project. In this case, your project is Wasatch Wildlife Watch. And then you would go through the administration process. They're going to then go and accept your account. Once they accept your account, you'll get the final <laughs> email saying that your account has been activated and you are ready to go. Once you have that, I can then start adding sites to your profile and you can start tagging photos. All I need in order to add sites to your profile is your username or the email address that you signed up with. So you'll just need to send me that email address, no need to send me your password or anything like that. A lot of you are very trusting and I thank you for that. But with email, um, people would send me their passwords. I don't need them, uh, just need the email that you signed up with. I'll then invite this, you to start contributing to the project. And then once you're there and you have your account ready to go, you then have the option of how you want to participate in looking through all of these different photos. 
Um, and so this year is a little bit unique since we had the COVID situations going on last year where we had a really big struggle getting our data uploaded um, because email just lost the ability to hold on to all of their staff. And the program ended up just kind of going under. And because of that, it created a backlog. So we not only have photos from this season that we're going to need to upload before the beginning of next field season, we actually still have the vast majority of um, data from 2020 that also needs to be uploaded as well. So you will have the option to do one or the other or both. So you can choose to upload the photos that you gathered um, from this year, or you can upload photos from a previous season. There are some goods and bads to both. Um, and so I just wanted to go over a little bit of that. If you select to upload from the 2020 field season, um, the good things with that is that those photos will be pre-sorted for, for you, or at least the vast majority of them will be. What that means is that all the blank photos or what we like to call um, blank photos, those are any photos that don't have a human, a vehicle or an animal. It seems like it was just vegetation or wind that was setting that off. Those are what we call blank photos. And for the vast majority of the 2020 photos, those have already been sorted through for you. So although we were not able to upload, we still had many of you that were awesome enough to go through and sort your photos for us. And so that was fantastic. And thank you so much. It's going to make uploading 2020 a breeze. Um, and so because of that, anyone that wants to upload those photos, they get the pre-sorted photos already. Um, another plus to that is that all the 2020 photos are stored on a Google Drive um, folder. And all of the sites are already created within the Wildlife Insights program, meaning there's no extra data sheets and no extra worry um, on your part. All you'll need to do is say, I'm ready to go. I want to participate in the 2020 field season photos. I will then do everything on the back end to assign the site to you. I'll then let you know when you're ready to go. You download the photos and you upload them to the program. It's as simple as that. Um, and then so this also does not require you temporarily storing any photos on your computer's hard drive other than to download them, to upload them. But the minute you upload the photos, which is about a five to 10 minute process, depending on how large the folder is, you can then immediately delete them off your computer. That's not the case for the 2021 photos. And as I'll get into in just a sec. Um, and then a big and really important thing for us is if you commit to the 2020 field season photos, we do ask that we try to set a deadline and we're gonna try and be hard about this of December 1st. Um, just because, like I said, we have two seasons now worth of data that we need to upload. And in order to get those products out, to advance the science, to look at everything that we're looking at, we're going to need those data sets as uploaded as quick as possible. I know that's a big task, um, and I'm going to be uh, with you every step of the way, uploading as many photos as I can as well. Um, but we're going to try and shoot for that December 1st deadline. That gives me an opportunity to then format the data sets and start running analysis. Um, so with the 2021 field season, so that's the stuff from this year. So if you have uh, just taken down your camera and you're ready to start looking through the photos from your season, um, there are a few things you'll need to do beforehand. So that big, the biggest one and probably the most time consuming is you will need to pre-sort your photos. Um, this is really actually to save you time on the back end. Um, and so what that means is removing those blanks, removing any photos that have humans, or other animals in them, that's gonna be really important to get rid of those before you upload to Wildlife Insights because the difference between Wildlife Insights and eMammal is Wildlife Insights comes with a built-in artificial intelligence program. It's actually going to give the first sweep of those photos. This was designed by Google. It's gonna give the, sweeps, the first sweep of those photos and try to identify what's in those photos for you or at least give you an idea of what you might be looking at. But because it requires that program, it does take a little bit longer to upload the photos themselves. Um, and so it's much quicker if you can pre-sort and get rid of the blanks and only upload the photos that are going to contribute to the data set. So then um, on top of that, since I won't have any of the data in hand to make the site for you before you get going, like I will with the 2020 field season, if you would do the 2021 upload, you are going to have to hold on to your entire packet, your entire data packet. Um, that's both your SD cards and your data sheets. The big reason we're going to do this is that I don't want to separate SD cards from data sheets. It's much easier to lose or um, lose track of where those sites came from if they're not together. And so if you elect to upload the photos from your 2021 site, you're going to need to hold on to that packet until you're done doing so, which just means basically it's going to be um, kind of on you to kind of make sure that that's in a safe place and those data get uploaded. And then finally, um, since there's going to be many people uploading the 2021 field season data, and I'm not going to be able to drive around to pick up all of this stuff um, during the fall field season, once you complete your upload, 
you will have to either mail that back or bring that folder back in to either the Wild Utah Project office or my office at the University of Utah once it's all said and done. And if you choose the mail-in option, you will have to temporarily um, store the photos from your SD card as a backup on your own personal computer until I can verify that I've received those SD cards in the mail. The only reason I'm doing this and putting this stipulation in for this year is that I actually had a bird banding data set from 2020 where we were looking at Red Butte Creek. Um, those data got sent through the mail with no backup and somehow it got lost in the mail and I lost an entire year's worth of 2020 uh, um, data in the mail without having a backup. So we are going to do a strict backup policy where we do make sure that all those photos are present somewhere before um, they are mailed off. And so then once I receive your SD cards and your packet in the mail, I'll then let you know, and you can go ahead and delete those photos off um, your hard drive if you uh, so choose. And then once again, so that we can really expedite this process and that we have a full data set, by the time we get to the 2022 field season, um, the deadline for upload of your photos from 2021 is the 1st of December um, as well. And I will be keeping track of basically just a spreadsheet of who's looking through photos. If you're not able to make this deadline, I may reach out to you and ask that you mail them back um, so that I can see if I have university students or myself that can get them uploaded uh, so that we can make sure that we are ready to go by the 2022 field season. Okay. So then to kind of give you a little bit more info and how you're gonna actually look through the photos if you select one or two or both of these seasons, if you select the 2020 field season, it's going to be a very easy process. All you're gonna to need to let me know is once you send me your email for your account, uh, all you then need to say is I'm ready to look for 2020 field season data. I will then share a Google Drive folder with you. And that Google Drive folder has all uh, I'm going to show you an example here. It has all of the photos from every site that we've uploaded from the 2020 field season. And what we're going to do with that is I'm going to select one of those sites that's already pre-made for you. And then I will send you a link that you can access to get to those photos. And so let's say that we are, for hypothetical situations, looking through this 2020 field season data, and I have sent you the BC04 rotation you'll notice that the folder will say completed or in progress or open next to it right here. That means that someone else, if it's completed, has gone through and deleted all of the blank photos. So they've gone through and they've cleaned out those images. If you're lucky enough to get one of those photos uh, folders, all you have to do is download the folder that says wildlife to your personal computer. That's all you'll need to do um, is download that folder. If it doesn't have a completed next to its name, you will have to instead download the original images file, sort through them, and upload the sorted photos into a file that you can create and you can call that whatever you want. I've been having people call it wildlife lately, um, but you'll, that's just the only extra step. And then once you've done that, we're now ready to go to upload those photos. That's the only step you will need to do before upload for the 2020 field season. If you elect instead to do the 2021 field season, there's a few uh, little things of information I will need. Since I won't be able to make the sites on the back end because I won't have the actual data sheets in hand like I will with the 2020 field season, I do require that you have to send me some information. And this is just so that I can actually create the sites within the Wildlife Insights program. So that includes the site name. And if you notice right here for the example, if your site was, let's say, Big Cottonwood 1, 2, and 3, it's going to say on the thing BC01 underscore 01. And then when you send me the name of the sites, uh, if you know it's from 2021, if you were the one that uploaded the data, just put the 2021 um, the little disclaimer right there at the end for me, uh, because you'll notice as you go through the Wildlife Insights program, and as you select the data to upload, there's gonna be repeating sites within that program. There's gonna be multiple RB01s, multiple, you know, every single site's gonna have a multiple of it. And what's gonna separate it from one year to the next is this little year marker right here. Um, and so you're gonna to wanna to make sure that if you're working with 2021 data, when you go to upload, you select the 2021 site. If I can just interject, for those of you that are new, you're probably thinking, how am I gonna know all this information? So um, you will not only get the, uh, 
the SD card, but you'll also get a physical hard copy of a folder with information about each, each site. Oh, thank you so much for saying that, Mary. Yeah. Um, so you will not only, yeah, you won't be left in the dark with just the photos. We will be giving you an entire packet that comes with the list of sites that you're looking at, as well as the data sheet that has all of this information for each one of those sites. So yeah, thank you very much, Mary, for um, touching on that. So that is the packet that you'll then use to get the information back to me so I can create the site. Um, and so on that packet for each site, it'll also have the GPS coordinates, the setup date and the takedown date. I'll just need you to send those to me as well as the landscape feature of focus. You'll see this, it's on the front of the data set um, under detection feature. And it'll just basically be circled for what feature that camera was specifically focused on. And you can just send me that. Um, and then on the back of the data sheet, it'll say whether or not the camera was functioning once it was taken down. So it's just a yes or no, you'll uh, need to just mark whether or not it was or was not functioning. And then any notes or oddities that may or may not be on the data sheet, if they happen to note something, um, you can just put that there. And then a note for you, if it's easier, once you have that packet in hand and you don't want to supply all this information in an email or something like that, you can also send me just a picture itself of the data sheet and I can extract all this information from that site by myself. Um, and so whichever works best for you, I'm good um, with either way. Okay, so that was kind of the nitty gritty stuff. We uh, talked a little bit about how to actually create an account. Um, and then we talked about the differences between the two seasons and how we're gonna upload data from them. And now we'll spend the rest of this training portion actually practicing uploading photos to the program. Um, and this is kind of the fun part. And so uh, to get right into it, let's go into our Wildlife Insights program here. Um, and let's sign in. And so I am already signed in, but I will go ahead and log out. And then we will go ahead and sign back in. I'm gonna sign in as my uh, test user and not as the project administrator. So you guys can see exactly what the program will look like to you when you sign up. Okay, so this is the homepage that you'll see when you log in. The most important thing for all of you. Um, and so if you're interested in taking a look at some of the data that's already been uploaded, you can always click on this right here. It'll just take you to the project itself, where those locations are, what species, how many images have been uploaded so far for this um, particular project, what we're getting a lot of as we go across the entire thing, just some a few stats. Um, you can also, once we have more photos uploaded, look at some of the analysis from it uh, if you're interested. But the most important part of what you'll need to do is right here is this upload button. This green upload button is going to be where you're going to be doing most of the um, work within the Wildlife Insights program. Um, and so then this is right after either you've been assigned a site for 2020 or you have let me know which sites you're interested in uploading for 2021. Once you've gotten that confirmation from me that you're ready to upload, all you have to do is log into your account, click the upload button. The first thing that's gonna pull up is it's gonna to navigate to somewhere on your desktop or on your computer's files. This is why it's important for you if you're using the 2020 data to have the actual SD card information or that wildlife photo downloaded onto your computer. So this is why it does require that you download that folder onto your own personal hard drive just for this upload process um, because this is where it's gonna to navigate to. And so we're going to go to um, this test upload that I have where I have assigned myself PC30. And I'm going to look at this um, little folder that has a snippet of 30 photos in it. Uh, and what's great about Wildlife Insights, if you're a returning user, you know that one of the issues with eMammal is that you only get one chance to upload all of your photos for an individual site. That's not the case with Wildlife Insights. You can upload in batches. So let's say you have a slow internet connection or you don't have all day to let it upload in the program to read it. You can upload a certain site in smaller batches. Uh, the biggest thing with this though is just remembering which photos have been uploaded and which ones still need to be uploaded. Um, and so that's gonna be kind of on you to either track which photos have been and which photos still need to be uploaded so that we ensure that our camera site is fully representative of everything that it captured and not just a small snippet. And so once we're done here, I'm going to then have to go in and upload all of these other batches to complete this site. Um, but for now, we're just going to upload these photos. 
And so to upload more than one photo, you select one photo and then you can either shift and control all, but basically you just wanna um, select all of the photos within whatever folder you're trying to upload. And then you just click the upload button right here. That's gonna then pull up a pop-up menu that says you've selected 25 files. If you wanna add more files to that, you can then drag and drop. If you're good with that and you're ready to go, you then just come down here. This will already be filled out for you that you're contributing to this project because I've signed you up to it. Then what you have to do, and this may be the most important part of your upload, is you need to select the correct site that you're uploading. So if I assign you BC04.2020, it's important that you select BC04.2020 on your camera deployments um, right here. In this case, I picked BC30 2020, so we're going to make sure we select PC30 2020. That's telling the program that the photos that are contained right here are being uploaded to this site, and that site comes with a GPS coordinate and all of the other information that you sent me. If you upload photos from a different site to the wrong site, I can fix it on the back end, but it will need to be identified as soon as possible um, because that data would then be basically misused. We'd be uploading the wrong photos to a different site. So you wanna make sure that you select the correct site. Once you've done that, you just click uh, the upload button. And right here, it's gonna give you a little progress bar telling you how fast um, it's being uploaded. It's typically a pretty fast process um, for things less than anywhere from one to 200 photos or so. Um, of course, it's going really, really slow right now. Do you but... press the plus 10 as well? Sorry, what was that? It said plus 10 photos. Can you can you press that as well? You can press that um, if you want to add other photos to it. Um, basically, that was just to view the other photos. So I don't know if you saw on the screen when it was uploading all 25 photos there. Yes. Um, and it showed on the screen, it only showed the first 15. So it just said there were another 10 photos that it was going to upload that you didn't have a view of. So if you wanted to see all of the photos that you're, the little thumbnails of all the photos, you could click that plus 10. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. But that's just to view them on the back end. Got it. Got it. Thank you. No problem. All right. So once it's down here, it says upload complete. You're then going to click on this identify button. And this is the fun part. All right. So once we're here, and I'm going to quickly get rid of this part right here. All right. Once we're right here, this is now the photos that we've just uploaded for this project. Um, and so if you've participated before and you've done the field work, you know that we have our photos set to take bursts. And then when within those bursts, our cameras then shut off for 15 seconds before taking another burst. Because of that, you'll notice that a lot of these photos seem to be of the exact same individual, um, but just maybe one or half a second behind and then nothing happens for another 15 seconds. So what the Wildlife Insights program allows you to do is say, instead of having to identify the same individual three times, let's group those photos into sequences so we only have to identify what's going on in the sequence and not what's going on in every single um, individual photo because we know that those three photos or whatever, those groups of photos are the same um, exact event. So you don't have to select that and you can, if you wish, only look at each individual photo, but if you would rather sequence your photos to match more of what we were actually doing when the photos were getting triggered, you go right here to this burst section and you can adjust it. And so in this case, I'm gonna select 15 seconds because that's the interval for our camera. And now you'll notice instead of having 25 images that I have to identify, I only have nine bursts now that I have to identify. And so this is gonna save you a bunch of time if you're hoping to look through your photos and do it in a fairly quick process. Um, another thing to mention that's different from eMAML here is when we worked with eMAML, we were uploading photos and you could only see the photos that you uploaded. With Wildlife Insights, it's much more of a group type of upload process where if someone else has uploaded photos and they haven't identified all of them, you will have the opportunity to identify those photos as well if you so choose. However, if you would rather just look through the photos from your camera, you can go down to the camera deployments drop down here and you can select your camera right here, PC30. Okay, so now we've sequenced the photos. Now we're gonna actually start to identify what's going on in those photos. And so to do that, we click on the sequence right here 
And we see right off the bat that the photos that we're looking at, we can either put them in grid size or group size. Um, there's also a way if you click on each individual photo to look at them um, in individual photo size to blow it up basically. And the first thing you'll notice is right here, there's animals in a burst and the computer program has said that it thinks it can identify what's in those animal photos. And so it's saying that it believes that there is a, um, in this case, Otocolius hemiotis, which is mule deer. Um, and what I'm going to do, for whatever reason, I'm not entirely sure, it's supposed to be common name, but of course, I did not change that setting in my thing. And so this is a scientific name, but basically it'll give you a first guess of what it thinks the animals in this photo are. And in this case, it's actually correct. It is um, a mule deer. And so what you would then do in this particular case is you would say, yes, it got it correct, or no, it did not get it correct, um, so on and so forth. And so let's say we wanted to go to the individual photo and click on it and see if there's anything else going on in here. We click on that photo and we can look at it and we can say, well, yes, there is a mule deer in here. But if you notice, there's also an, a little one right here in the background. And this is incredibly important. So one of the big things we're looking at moving forward is trying to identify individual animals, but also where breeding populations are. And we can't do that unless we identify where the juveniles are. And so although it's got the um, species correct, it doesn't have the count correct. There's actually two individuals. And since there's a juvenile here, we have to edit this. And you'll find that you're gonna have to edit the computer's classification a lot especially for the first photos you upload, because this is the first data set within Wildlife Insights that's coming from the Rocky Mountain area. So it's not gonna be perfect with its classifications. So what we would do here is we'd say, we actually need to edit this classification. And we need to say, this one's correct. There is one adult mule deer, but we need to add a second And you will not have to know the scientific name. Don't worry about that. I just forgot to switch that over. Um, and then, so then we need to add a second one, mule deer. And then we are going to click on this drop down menu and select the age. And in this case, it's juvenile. So now we're saying that the identification is one adult mule deer and one juvenile mule deer, which is much better uh, um, classification. And then if you want to do a little bit extra and help the computer program with its next identification, you can also mark whether or not the bounding box had all of the animals in the photo, but you don't need to. So then you just click on save changes. And if we click out of this really quick, we'll then see that for that photo, that one photo within that sequence, it's now gone and it's uploaded to the database. We could also, since we know this is a sequence, we could edit the entire sequence instead of having to edit each individual photo. In this case saying, this is a juvenile, update images and apply it to the entire thing. So now that one has been completely uploaded. And then it's just basically gonna take you sequence from sequence, um, all the way till the end of the row. And so once again, you can pull up the individual photo. You can see whether or not it has all of the individuals in there. Once again, it's missing the young one. The computer program is gonna do this a lot at the initial stages before the more juvenile mule deer it sees, the better it'll be at picking them up. But for right now, it's gonna do a really poor job of um, picking up all of the individual animals. But you're just gonna have to basically go in edit it every time it's wrong, and then continue to upload. So I'm not going to go through this entire upload process, um, but that is basically the gist of it. Uh, if you see that there's more than one individual in a photo, all you have to do is select edit and edit the count right here. If the classification is actually completely incorrect and it says this is a domestic dog or something like that, you can also select the actual species that it is um, and you can make that adjustment as well. The last thing I wanted to show you is that if you're interested 
And if you really like the photos that you're looking at, let's say we really love this mule deer photo. I think it's pretty great. Um, and you want to highlight it on our project website. You can click the highlight button right here and those photos are made publicly available. Um, I actually recommend you do that as much as possible. Uh, even, you know, if you like the mule deer butt, you can do that too. Uh, the only stipulation here is human photos when identified are automatically deleted from the program. Um, and so any human photos that are uploaded cannot be highlighted and cannot be downloaded. Um, and so even if it's a really funny sequence, do not upload or highlight any human photos. Um, okay, so with that, that is uh, the process for uploading these photos. Uh, last thing I wanted to show you guys before I'm cutting into our question and answer time. So last thing I wanted to show you is a few do's and don'ts for the program. Um, the first one is a big do. So do pre-sort the images before uploading. That is basically just removing those blanks before you look at it. It's important when you're removing the blanks that you are 100% certain that there is not an animal in that photo. Many times as we're looking through the project um, and we're looking through photos, we might not think there's one there, um, but a deeper dive uh, or a deeper look into it, you might actually find that there's something scurrying about that you didn't notice the first time. Uh, another do is only tag animals you are 100% sure about. In eMammal, we used to have you guess if you were unsure about the identification. Uh, you can still do that in Wildlife Insights, but it's much harder to correct those guesses. And so if you are not 100% sure, just leave that identification to be, and I can go in and do that, or someone else that's more um, that knows that species a little bit better can go in and identify them. Once again, I can correct if they're un, uh, identified incorrectly. It's just a little bit harder to do in Wildlife Insights than it was in eMammal. Um, remember to include information on age. If it's very apparent and easy that you can distinguish between juveniles and adults, um, just to go into that edit portion that I had showed you before. Um, include the count whenever you're looking at non-human species. If you're looking at humans, no need to include the count. Uh, a lot of the times you'll have 20, 30, 40 humans in a uh, sequence. No need to include that count. We model humans as groups of humans anyway. Um, the last uh, thing with the counts is include information from the total sequence. So if you choose to sequence your photos, when you're looking through the sequence, that identification that you're making you can choose to have it go to each individual photo, or you can choose to have it go to the entire sequence. If you apply it to the entire sequence, make sure that you're including what's going on in that entire sequence. So if there's only one mule deer, great. If there's only one mule deer and it's easy to tell that it's the same one for the first three photos, awesome. But if in photo one and two, there's one mule deer, but then in photo three, another one comes into play, the classification for that sequence would be two mule deer. Um, remember to favor any awesome photos that you have and that you see. And then this is a big one. Once you've uploaded photos, and this is uh, all of the photos from a camera site, they don't have to be tagged. Please let me know so I can keep track of who has uploaded their photos. Even if, like I said, you haven't tagged them all, it's good to let me know if they have been all uploaded. And then finally, some do nots. Please remember to tag all, uh, do not tag the animals you are not 100% sure about. It's much easier for me to fix identifications in the identify window than in the review window. So um, if you're not 100% sure, don't make that classification. Uh, please do not upload human photos to social media at all in any way, shape, or form. That's a big no-no for this project. Um, please do not favorite any human photos as well. Uh, we don't want any human photos going on to um, the public website. We don't want to violate anybody's privacy or any privacy laws. Um, please do not ignore counts of non-human animals. If there's more than one uh, mule deer in a photo or more than one mountain lion in a uh, photo or a sequence, please include the total count. Uh, please do not only upload a subset of the camera's photos. So like I said, you can upload in batches, but if you choose to go that route, make sure that you upload all of the batches for a single camera site. And then if you choose to mail your packet back to me, please do not forget to back up those photos when mailing them back. And then finally, last but not least, please do not trust the AI to always make accurate classifications. It's going to get better and better and better. And the more data we upload, the better and better it gets. But like I said, this is the only data set it's been trained on so far for Rocky Mountain species. Um, and so you might see a lot of times if you have a mule deer uh, or if you have a mountain lion, it's going to incorrectly identify those with species that are present in the eastern United States because there's a lot more data from there. Um, and so don't always trust the AS uh, classifications. Okay, um, so with that, basically, uh, thank you very much. Um,
And Mary, would you like me to turn it over to you for the end or do you want me to kind of run with it here? Um, yeah, we could, just to get to the Q&A would be great. Um, this slide is just kind of one that we always hang on to. If you are interested in the project and you're a potential community partner um, and able to uh, let us know about grants and different opportunities for funding, we're always looking for ways to keep this project funded. Awesome. Yeah. And then um, last but not least, thank you all for participating. This is an amazing effort uh, that we've been able to put together for so many years, and it's solely due to all of you. Um, the amount of photos that we have looked through as a group has surpassed one point, I think it was at 2 million last time I checked. So over 1 million photos have been classified over two years of the project. As we add the photos from this year and next year, it's going to um, double that amount. So it's an amazing effort. Over 700 sites will eventually be uploaded once we're done with this. Um, and so the amount of data that we are gathering is incredible. And that's why we get to do so much with it. And all of that is solely because of you. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, and thank you so much for participating in this project. I think we have, um, I think I went about 10 minutes over. I really apologize for that. So I wanna save the rest of the time for Q and A. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Uh, and turn it over to um, Sarah, Mary, and all of you guys for questions. I'm just going to, oh, go ahead, Sarah. Oh, I was just going to say, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat and we will answer them live. Or if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask um, verbally, you're free to do that as well. Hey, this is um, Steve Schmidt. I'm using my wife's Zoom, so it says Anita. Sorry about that. Um, so Austin on blanks, you were saying to remove humans and certain animals, and then I, I just got confused. So what are examples of blanks that you want us to remove before upload? That's a that's a really good question, Stephen. Thank you. Um, hopefully I can clarify that here. Uh, so when we talk about blanks, we're talking about any photos that do not have animals humans or vehicles so that that is any photo that seems to have been caused by swaying vegetation wind even the sun so if it looks like there's no animal or there uh, there's no people or uh, no vehicle of any kind those are the blank images that you're going to delete um, and you're going to remove those from the folder that you upload okay yeah, that's great so just to piggyback on that question um, you know the the sensitivity of human photos so uh, just to clarify, Austin, you're ready to, you've got your list. Some of these photos have uh, people in them. Those are getting uploaded. And, and the reason we do that is because we are interested in how, how these wildlife um, behaviors may change with the present presence of people. So they're still getting uploaded into the database. Um, so can you give an example of what happens? So you showed us the mule deer example. What happens if you have a sensitive um, human photo or even a photo of a vehicle where you can see the license plate or something? What is the classification you make on something like that? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, when you classify a human, you are given the option to say what the human is doing. So whether they're a hiker um, or they're a biker or something like that, you can choose to select that. Uh, layer, uh, that extra layer of detail, or you can just select human non-staff or human being. Um, and then once you do that, the program will give you a prompt saying uh, there's a human being in this sequence or there's a human being in these, in these photos. Um, is that correct? You then just say yes or okay. And it uploads it to the database. And so it gives us um, information and data on the fact that there's a human being at that site, but then it automatically deletes that photo from the program and removes it from the uh, public, publicly accessible website. And so it's going to mask that the, the uh, photo itself, but it's gonna retain all the data from the classification and the timestamp and the location. And almost all of you will probably see human photos and uh, at, at the very least, the human that set up the camera. So um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you will definitely see that um yeah and there is a specific so if you can obviously tell that someone's setting up the camera um it's much easier if you just put camera trapper there it's the same thing um but basically that helps us know that oh that's not a human being that we need to include 
an analysis, that's someone that was act, out there setting up the camera. Um, so thanks for that clarification as well. But yeah, anytime you upload photos of humans, it'll give you a prompt saying, "There's is there a human being identified in this photo? You select yes, it stores the data, but then removes the photo. So, so another one, what about the placard photos? Those also count as a camera trap photo. So anytime you see a photo of a human that looks like they're obviously setting up the um, camera trap or they're having the placard photos, you can identify those instead as camera trapper or researcher, whichever one you prefer. Got it. We have a great question from uh, Amber that, you know, she's, they're not in the project area, but would love to participate in CERT photos. So um, I think the answer is absolutely yes. You do not physically have to be in the area. Um, Austin, can you talk about how people who um, are remote or from different um, locations can participate? Absolutely, yes. So um, the first one is those 2020 photos are all remotely accessible. Um, and so that would just constitute me sharing that Google Drive folder with you. You just then download the photos and they're right there ready to go. Um, and you can do that anywhere uh, at any time. However, if you'd like to look through 2021 photos, but you're also remote, uh, I will be getting quite a few of those sites brought back to me in person. Um, and I will, I can with those sites, if anyone's wanting to do a remote upload, do the exact same thing that was already done for 2020. I can do those for the 2021 photos as well. So it would be the same process. I would upload them to a Google Drive folder, share that folder with you, and then you would download them and upload them to the program. And I don't see any other questions here. We have just a couple more minutes for you to get your questions in. I just have a quick question. When, when I set up a camera, I take like 50 photos of myself. I usually don't upload all of them. I usually just upload the placard photographs. Do you want all of them? Uh, no, that's a great question, Marianne. Um, yeah, and you don't have to upload all of them. Uh, really, the biggest thing is uploading at least one of them. Um, so, so for a lot of analysis that's done outside of my personal program, so those nationwide studies that you saw, I send the data to them and they classify start date and end date from those camera trapping classifications. So it's only important that they have at least one photo from the end and one photo from the beginning. You don't need to upload, like you said, the 50 or even hundreds of photos um, uh, that you might have of you setting them up. Okay, thanks. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, do you define juvenile as only uh, this year's young? Because um, sometimes we see young animals that may not be this year's. Uh, the other question is, should we flag for you where we see hunters? That's a great, those are, I mean, amazing questions. Fantastic. Uh, so it's really difficult in uh, camera images to distinguish between first and second year young in a lot of cases. Um, you know, not so I guess basically the bigger, the larger the species, sometimes the easier it is to distinguish between the two years. Um, but if you can just physically distinguish between the fact that there are young present. So if a mountain lion is accompanied by another mountain lion that's smaller and there's obviously not a male female difference there, um, then you can classify that whether it's one or second year. Uh, basically, what we're trying to do with that data is identify where individual animals are giving birth. Um, and the great thing about a lot of these mammalian species in this area is that once they've given birth, their home ranges shrink considerably. Uh, and so because of that, with the buffer we place around each camera, if you spot a camera with young in it, there's a very good chance that the buffer applied to that camera it contains the vast majority of the home range for that individual species. Um, and so that's why it's mostly important that you identify if it was young. And if you can tell if it was first or second year or you know any type of um, in between there, that's the biggest thing. If you cannot tell and you are not 100% certain about a juvenile classification, simply leave it blank. And then your other question was, I'm sorry, I spent too much time on that one. What was the other one? Identifying hunters. Oh, identifying hunters. Uh, yes, you are more than welcome to do so. That would be great. It's a little extra detail and it is an option. You can select a human and then hunter as the classification. You'll see when you go and you type in human, it gives you a bunch of different options. Um, the more detail, the better, 100%. It's not necessary, um, but if you want to supply that detail, that's fantastic. 
We have another question here that says, along with Amber's question, when verifying our Wildlife Insights account, how should we answer the questions asking for information about data sets and software we're using to tag photos? Um, that's a great question. So the data sets uh, that you'll be interested in is the Wasatch Wildlife Watch data set. Basically, you can just put, uh, put Wasatch Wildlife Watch for anything that is, it's asking you as far as interest goes. Um, and then for the, um, what was the other aspect? I'm sorry. Oh, the software. Oh, the software, uh, you can just put Wildlife Insights. Um, and so that you will be directly using their software to upload it. Perfect. I looks like we're kind of at the end of our time here. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to reach out to us as well. Um, and we can answer those for you. Thanks again to all of you for joining us tonight and for being part of this important project. Thank you to Austin and Mary for presenting on, on this. It's, it's such a wonderful project and yeah, we're very grateful for all of you. Yeah, and then can I just add lately, like there will be other questions and bugs that come up as you're going through the process. This is not the only chance you get to ask me questions. In fact, I encourage that you ask me questions throughout the process. It's much better that you potentially ask me questions every single day or every single time you're going through this than to, uh, to potentially do something incorrect uh, because you didn't want to ask that question or something like that or felt like it would be too much. There's no limit to the amount of times you can ask me um, for any of this process. And it's a new program, it just released. So there will be bugs. And if you find those bugs, it's actually great that I, if I can report them back to the developers um, so we can get them fixed. So yeah, uh, you know, there's a little bit of the guinea pig thing going on here. And so thank you very much for participating, but um, we're gonna try and make this as smooth as possible. And I, I really am happy with the way the program looks. Yeah, so we'll have our, our emails and contact in our follow-up email. Um, and we'll also be sending out a recording. So feel free to share about this project to anyone and they can still join even if, even if they're not here tonight. So yeah, thanks again. And we'll be hearing from you through the season. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.